welcome to today's panel discussion, um, The Impact of Art in Unprecedented Times. I am joined by Simon, the other half of Lacuna Festivals, and uh, today's panel of Lucy Dijankovic, Professor Kenneth G. Hay, and Valerie Wolfgang. Um, I'm going to turn to um, the panel members now to do a short introduction um, before we start the discussion. So I will hand over to Lucy Jo. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm by trade, I'm actually a fashion and textile designer. And when it comes to this topic, it's quite uh, similar. Uh, I find it when it comes to all creative industries and the impact of uh, art and creative industries in these unprecedented times. And it's, I find it quite a challenge because I, I try to combine all this, um, these different discipline, disciplines of uh, design and arts and visual arts. And yeah, we'll see in uh, the discussion further. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, shall we continue with the, my introduction? Right? Yeah. There's a bit of internet. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, yeah, I, it was a bit of internet disturbance, but now I think we're back. And so my name is Valerie Wolfgang. As, as well as Lucia, I'm also from Slovenia. I'm, um, uh, how to describe, my work, I'm intermedia artist, film director, uh, visual artist, and also a mentor. I also have students I teach, uh, contemporary art practices and experimental forms, which is basically based from um, avant-garde film and experimental film. And um, I've been working professionally in arts for the past, I don't know, 13, 14 years, something like that. Uh, and uh, this COVID-19 situation also influenced my art in the past months, but I think we all got that experience. And my was quite interested because interesting because I was just at the art residency in Germany, finishing my work. And two days before I was supposed to fly back to Ljubljana and continue with some exhibition in Paris and some other venues around Europe. Uh, my flight was cancelled and suddenly everything changed and I was not stuck, but yeah, in a way stuck in Germany for the next two months in this art residency apartment. So it was quite interesting for me, the whole uh, first weeks of experience of this brave new world. I call it like that, and uh, I'm curious how this discussion will develop today, but I'm sure that many of the artists and cultural workers today have similar experiences and uh, visions about the future and the past. So I'm uh, really excited to be the panel member uh, of this discussion today. Over to Ken. Hoping, can you hear me with my microphone, my dodgy microphone? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so my name's Ken Ken Hay. Um, I'm now living in a little village in the south of France. But, but before, I was head of fine art at Leeds University, and then head of contemporary art practice at the School of Design at Leeds University. I've been teaching probably since the. 80s, I guess. I don't know. It seems like a long time. But I, I'm also a writer and a teacher. I teach in the uh, Czech Republic um, every year I'm in Brno. And I'm involved in seminar of aesthetics at Masaryk University. Uh, I'm also a writer, so I'm working on catalogues and publications, mostly about philosophy of art, semantics, and things like that. So I, I work in France based around my, my studio practice, but I also work in a, in a distributed way because my partner works in London. 
So we have we work on literally the same paintings sometimes. I do one piece and she does another piece, and we do it by internet and we do it by by real visits and and um, occasional uh, longer term stays. So it's quite a complicated practice. Um, and this year was going to be a big year for us because we had a show in Japan lined up in June. And I was teaching in Brno. I was supposed to be in Malta, um, examining at the university there. So for me, COVID has completely um, terminated my my travel. Um, on the negative side, on the positive side, where I live is a very small village, and I have a garden. I'm self sufficient really. So for me, COVID kind of passed by in the, in other places, and my, my own village was relatively untouched. Touchwood still has been. Um, so um, yeah, that's about it really, and we'll, we'll probably carry on with some of the more generalized um, ways that COVID has, has affected us all. Thanks very much for your introductions, and I guess we should say a little bit as well. So, um, hi, I'm Sarah Jane. Um, I've been practicing art and teaching art for, feels like a long time now. Um, many years, <laughs> um, schools, colleges, universities. Um, I've been freelance for about 10 years now. Um, I split my time between the UK and Lanzarote. Um, and I work with, in the UK, a lot of museums and galleries, um, expanding their educational offer and their participatory offer. Um, so I run a lot of engagement projects and in Lanzarote um, I exhibit but also I help to run um, the studios and I direct the festivals um, with Simon. Mm. Um, I am a land artist and a photographer. Um, I've been a land artist now for about six years and a photographer for as long as I can remember. Um, yeah, and I also, I live here in Lanzarote. Um, unlike Sarah, I'm permanently based here. And I also work as assistant director on the festivals and technology manager of the festivals <laughs> yeah none of this year would have happened without simon i can tell you that much <laughs> thank you <laughs> um okay so we're gonna be sort of mainly hosting the the thing that i found about hosting these discussions particularly online is that it's um kind of harder to separate yourself as a host um so yeah do forgive us if we get a little bit involved but we will try and um, leave the space for, for you guys. Um, so I know that you've all kind of ha had some thoughts about the things that you would like to share and bring to the table. Um, and we can start with um, Lucija again, if that's all right. Okay. Um, are you waiting for me to to openly start talking or yeah if you have I'm sorry a, no no that's okay if I you lost have anything um, kind of prepared or any sort of particular slant that interests you on the topic or a question you would like to propose that the panel can work towards resolving anything like this just to that you'd like to kind of bring at the opening of the discussion uh, okay uh, yes I've been finding myself it, when the the pandemic started and when Slovenia decided to quarantine uh, and to close the borders and we were stuck at home. I actually got this strange feeling that I've never felt before. And that was, I felt so incredibly useless <laughs> in this, you know, in this times, because here I was doing 
something which is basically for myself. It's it, it kind of comes from me. It's my expression. It's my thoughts that I put out into the world. It's the reflections I have. And by the end of everything, I felt so powerless because you would see people and the essential workers and especially how the the government and the whole society was treating different professions and different uh, different workers unequally and of course uh, there's there are the ones that were and are actually helping a lot with the pandemic and keeping us safe and etc but on the other on the other hand me personally i was affected by losing all the clients i lost all the work i basically didn't have anything to do for a few months because at the end of the day no one needed my services and it was quite a you know spiral going on lucia do you think this was what you're saying do you think it's the result of the political decisions or do you think it's more like a media kind of thing, you know, when, at least when I was following the media from uh, Germany, Slovenian media, I, I didn't follow very international news, but I was focusing on Slovenian because I was trying to get home from Germany and checking the situation, which was different than in Germany. Do you think it's more the result of general media kind of panic or like losing the clients and uh, keeping the business closed or is it more because the wrong political decisions what what's your thoughts on that maybe well that is actually a quite a an interesting and good question because as you know slovenia was just uh, changing governments and we were changing government leaders and it was at the worst time possible mm. and not to be biased personally i'm not a fan of uh, current uh, prime minister and his views on everything because even the national television here is striking at the moment they're losing money and i just read on the news today that galleries and museums suffered a great financial loss because they were forced to be closed for two months. And of course, there's a lot of a, a huge impact from uh, the leadership that happened because there were some threats of becoming a police country and there were a lot of restrictions uh, we were supposed to, you were, you were not supposed to leave your area and people were, weren't able to either see their family or leave their houses and it was uh, quite rough. And on the other hand, of course, the media, because there's a lot of influences from different uh, different news sources that are not uh, that objective they're very you know fear driven and i think that at the end of the day all of it kind of impacted on how we we managed to to went through it and unfortunately we, uh, we are gaining new cases here and we are all fear in a fear that it's going to happen all over again and very very soon yeah my concerns are in general that because of this scarcity and this paranoia which was even i think over created by media as well that it will have even greater impact on the culture sector in general because it's constantly now repeating um, the thoughts in the media towards the future, um, you know, about uh, that maybe if you will go to 
see one show, this is your next bad rap. So this is constantly being repeated and maybe it's getting engraved into people's mind that, you know, to be present in some cultural events in the future, it's gonna have this scary feeling constantly being there. So I'm afraid that this will happen. And maybe it sh I, I totally support physical distancing and of course, a big hygiene uh, thing and, you know, to be cautious, but I'm worried that it's constantly being repeated. Arts, culture, galleries means you will get sick, you will therefore die possibly. So if this is constantly being uh, repeated, I'm afraid it's gonna stick in our minds. So uh, there, I'm just afraid about that. There, this is my thoughts. And maybe this will be discussed in the future, soon. <laughs> I think here in France, if I can um, butt in, um, I think to begin with, I've handled it quite well, really. I think Macron and his government were on top of the situation very quickly. So we were shut down immediately as soon as it became evident that this was serious. We were shut down and we had a very, very efficient policing system. You were allowed to go 100 meters from your door. You were allowed to go out for a walk once a day. But if you went out, you had to have a signed paper so that they put the papers up online. You had to download it, print it out and, and carry it. And if you didn't carry it, you got a fine. And the fines went from 35 euros up to 135 euros. So, um, you're only allowed out for specific reasons, for shopping, for visiting elderly relatives, etc. So it worked really pretty well and people were pretty much in respect of it. It, it of course, it encouraged fear, um, but that was fear channeled in a quite constructive way that people were obliged to stay at home. So although it was very bad in some parts of France, um, especially on the, on the German-Belgian border, and we are still getting cases now in the north, uh, uh, um, it, on the whole, whole thing done well. um, in terms of how it's impacting on galleries and things, um, the, the museums are now open again in France, so people can go, um, but they have to mean they have to be wearing a mask and they have to use hand sanitizers. It's it's the same as any other internal place like a supermarket or whatever. So I, I'm I'm possibly less pessimistic about that, and I'm also relatively optimistic about the vaccines. I think Oxford has made some really good research. They've already got a vaccine which they know has some effect and they're working on you know, the next series of tests. So I think with the, the combined scientific expertise of the entire world, which has never happened before, we've never had the entire world and its medical teams working towards one goal. I, I, remain, I remain relatively optimistic that they will find either a vaccine or some kind of palliative medicine which will you know, make things better. But meantime, I think obviously, yes, we have to be careful. And, and I don't see it um, ending for another six months or so. I, I imagine it's going to be a year or two that we have to live in this uh, sort of um, twilight zone. Yeah, and also... So uh, for me, I think it impacts artists in different ways. Mm. No, I just wanted to just add that, okay, maybe we will conquered the COVID-19, but I'm sure, you know, there's going to be many other viruses in the future. So in a way, we will have to get used to some of the protection in general and the hygiene and this uh, disinfection. And later, yeah. I would just like to add something, how it literally impacted my art installations, but uh, mm. I will continue uh, in a second. I was just going to say that um, it affects us in all of us in lots of ways, and what, one of the biggest ways is to do with how we interface with the public. Because I, I have a relatively open studio; I have a space which is open to the public, and I, I'm working in my space. But people are welcome to come in and and sort of part, you know participate, and I do projects here and things like that. So, so obviously, that has had to stop. Um, and putting things online is a bit of a uh, a bit of a feeble gesture, really, because there are so many millions of web pages up. Unless somebody has a particular reason to look at your web page, then your web page is just going to sit there along with all the other millions of web pages. So um, we need to learn ways to be smart about how to interact with technology and how to interface with people. And probably for the next couple of years, that's going to be one of the major challenges for artists who are, who are not so technical, perhaps, that they're, they're going to have to learn to be a bit more um, flexible about how they interface with the public.
thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I just wanted to add. Thank you for sharing Sorry. your. Uh, your it was a bit of a lag. Um, everybody. Um, so we have a pessimistic view, an optimistic view, um, <laughs> and somebody who's kind of feeling a little bit powerless. And yeah, I can, I'm sure that most people will kind of relate to one or all of those feelings <laughs> at different points um, in, the, in the pandemic. Um, so maybe if we kind of springboard off Ken's last point and talk about um, this kind of interfacing with people, how that's going to happen in the future, particularly for artists where um, seeing their work in the flesh is kind of really important, maybe because you have to walk through it or round it or see it projected from different angles or because it has textural paint or, I mean, there's hundreds of reasons, but kind of how we can kind of think around those issues in this, in this new world. Yeah, I just had a meeting two days ago, actually. That's what I wanted to uh, say uh, prior uh, to you, what you just opened, but it's a perfect question. Uh, I had meeting recently um, about one of my installations, which I will have this autumn in one big museum. And part of the installation is uh, like a sound piece with many directional speakers. Uh, uh, no, it was with headphones and it was visually already everything prepared with uh, like 20 headphones. It was in my vision, you know, the headphones was, was part of the installation. Everything was focused on that visual part of it. But the museum now said there shouldn't be any headphones because people are touching it. So I have to now think of how to completely actually change the already produced work work. And now they want me to use the directional speakers instead of headphones. But it means it will visually also impact my work. So I'm afraid in the future or even to, for my past works, which will be exhibited again, I will have to change a couple of elements just because of these precautions. But it's not for me, it's not just a technical kind of solution. It's actually a visual uh, influence on my work. So I was very stressed on that meeting I mean, I will work towards that because it's like, uh, it's not just a suggestion, it's like a direction from a museum, you have to do it. But it's a big compromise for me and it's somehow like they are editing my work. And so Corona is actually editing my work and being inter, like a little curator, I would say, a little virus curator, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's this is the problem, and also I was already had a couple of meetings for the, some production for 2021, also for some installation and interactive pieces. And already the curators told me everything you will do, you have to be aware that people should not should not touch your work. But I have often in my work, people have to touch my things. I use body wearable sensors which touch the skin. I use some like brain computer interface technology, which you need to actually put on your head and like a touch very close to your mouth. Also VR glasses or augmented reality glasses, which you actually put on your nose. This is really dangerous for virus transmission. And uh, it's, it's going to be a big challenge to work uh, in that sector actually, even though it seems okay, it's just a thing which you can go around and maybe use some other technology but for me you know it's very important also aesthetically so i'm afraid it's gonna influence my visual arts as well yeah no the the challenge we are actually facing similar challenges within uh, fashion and clothing uh, industry because you cannot prevent people from coming into closed, closed uh, spaces and trying on things and you, you cannot, I mean, no one can try something on and have the resource to, to wash it and dry it and prepare it for the next person. 
you know it's a part of shopping you touch everything you you put on clothes and uh, especially now a lot of my colleagues are very dependent on tourists on sales uh, from uh, tourists and basically we have none in Ljubljana and the sales had uh, fallen drastically and uh, fashion weeks were cancelled and you know all these events that actually helped with sales and helped with promotion and everything was you know cut and we are now facing the new ideas of how the future of our our industry is going to to look like how to uh, connect with people again how to present uh, your collections and ideas so it's going to be quite a quite a challenge i think Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see how those those influences really impact on your work if it's to do if it's tactile and um, sensorial. I suppose I'm a, I'm a little bit luckier in the sense that most mostly I'm a painter. Um, I I do video and sound and installations and films and other things, but the work I've been working on recently has mostly been painting. So, so I was impacted in the sense that I'd organised the shows and I had bought tickets and paid for the spaces and things like this, and suddenly that was all cancelled and. So far, I haven't been reimbursed, so that's had a certain impact on my finances. But, but paintings, literally, I think, um, haven't been so affected by the virus as other things because I carry on working in the way that I was working in before. It hasn't really necessitated that I change. Um, and in fact, the, the, the absolute silence here is something which really impacted on me because I, I live on a road, it's not a, it's not a major road, but it's a, a country road, and we're near Toulouse Airport, which is one of the big airports. So at any time in the day here before, there were always trucks going past on the road and eight or nine airplanes in the sky all the time. Even though you're in the middle of the forest, you know, we have a forest the size of Paris next to me, huge forest. But even if you go into the heart of the forest, you're always aware of airplane noise above you. So for the first few weeks of confinement, I was sitting in my garden and my ears were, were kind of aching. I was waiting for a sound. It was co so completely silent. Um, and I really thought this is actually, although the, the situation is of course tragic, um, it was also um, very, un very strange because it was literally like an experience that none of us will ever have again. It was like living in the 17th century to be able to go out into nature and not hear machinery, not hear cars, not hear traffic, not hear planes, not see movement. It really was like a, a sudden jump back into the 17th century for just as an experience. It was something really quite remarkable. You're aware of all the chaos and all the, the trouble and the pain that is causing to, to people all around you. But in, 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 the, in this tiny little village, you're suddenly cut off from everything. And it, it was like being in a being in a, it's like a sound chamber or something like that, some, some kind of, like in a submarine or something, and we're just sort of locked into some really strange silence. So I think, so, although the painting hasn't actually changed, um, I'm still carrying on working in the ways that I was working before. I think probably this experience of total silence is probably going to have some impact on my, on my working in the future. I can't, I can't really imagine how yet. Yeah, I, I have similar experience with the silence. I was uh, in this residency, which I mentioned in Germany, which was in smaller village town as well. And to be more on to the positive, optimistic side of the whole experience, um, it was also very silent, very, how to say, unsocial kind of experience for me, but that was great because suddenly my schedule cleared out and I could focus really on myself and I spent a lot of time in nature. Thankfully, I was next to huge forest, like miles and miles of just forest. 
So I started to run a lot. I started to do sports and uh, I ran a couple half marathons and I'm actually now training for my first full marathon. So I'm including a lot of sports in my uh, usual practice, art practice. I never did that before. So, um, and I'm starting now to really sense this strong body-mind connection, which is important for the uh, art as well. And I mean, in general, for profession, for life and stuff like that. So to be, to keep on the positive note, uh, I think this vacuum of being uh, in uh, this uh, nature and also planes not flying, uh, cancelled events and stuff like that. I think it was a positive thing, not just for me, but I think for society in general to think what, rethink what's important uh, in our personal lives and then reflect that also to our careers and maybe think on arts in general, like the purpose of being creative, how to be motivated and inspired, even though the whole world is changing and crashing in a way, and you know the the change is coming and it's here, but we shouldn't be afraid of changes, but embrace it, and of course find solutions for the negative sides as well. So for me, it was also a good uh, time for looking inside of me and. Uh, discovering new layers which I didn't knew they exist. Very briefly, just two things. In, uh, in France, I was reading the statistics on the safeties of different jobs, different professions, and they went through the most thing because of the virus. And the, the two safest jobs, they reckoned, were being an artist and being a forester. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Because, because, of course, social distance. We, we t artists tend to be isolated. <laughs> And foresters also tend to be isolated, so... <laughs> I love it. A little by the side. You know, it's funny because before the, uh, the COVID, I actually didn't know my neighbors that well. I knew, I knew them, uh, you know, visually. But during the quarantine, I actually met all my neighbors and we've been having drinks together and we've been preparing lunches together. We just started taking care of each other. And, you know, it, it was this very unique and wonderful experience. And that it, if it, it'll sound strange, but that is the one thing that I'm thankful for, for this situation at the moment that I actually got a chance to meet people and to, to get to know them because before we were just living, you know, past each other and it's quite a cherishing moment. So that's why maybe I think it was a wrong decision to close the museums and all this art uh, institution during the pandemic. I think it should be open and encourage people to come in, of course, with protection and stuff like that. But th maybe these galleries and museums and, you know, theaters should become a place of safety with proper precautions and meet and exchange ideas. So, you know, that in, in this similar way, it would be nice to gather people when the pande pandemic is happening, but of course with disinfection and stuff like that, but not to, to close physical buildings. I think this is maybe not the right solution. And also I would say that by streaming and sharing arts virtually during the corona, I think many people experienced a lot of cultural events which they didn't have access before. I know many friends, uh, they followed some operas for the first time. I mean, it's online, it's not, of course, the same quality, but at least they watched a couple of theater performances and operas and some concerts. But I just really hope it's not just the temporary thing, but it's a, a, a medium which will now open more curiosity with them and invite them in the future to see these things live. And me personally, I started to read books again. I completely stopped with reading physical books uh, in the past years, but now I'm 
like every day I'm reading again and um, I read many books in the quarantine. So I'm discovering literature again, like uh, I think that's a positive thing as well. I've actually started cooking. Oh, really? <laughs> I haven't been cooking for... Because, well. I mean, for me, just uh, buying pasta and boiling it, it's not cooking, that's just preparing yeah. food. But I actually started making my own pasta. I was baking my own bread, which I've never done before. And I've seen it on social media. Everyone was baking bread, and I was like, I can do it too. Uh, so there were all these, you know, small challenges... Uh, and it was, as you said, getting into books again, uh, playing music, going to virtual concerts and all these events were going on. And it, it was kind of a way of connecting people, but without being physically present. And as you said, for the museums and galleries, mm -hmm. I think that it would be safe and manageable if they would be open and would allow, I don't know, up to five people at once because everyone can be in separate rooms. And, and I think it would be more of an enjoyable experience because you would have time to look at art and very, you know, take it all in instead of being in a crowd and just passing by some, uh, some artwork because there would be too much people. I know I do that a lot. If there's a crowd, I lose interest in something because I don't want to stand there and wait. I want to, to see it and have my own time and space to do so. I think one of the, one of the good things that came out of the confinement period was the, the fact that so many people had time to read and watch movies and all this, things, but also people who were perhaps not, didn't think of themselves as creative were encouraged to do all sorts of crazy things. I, I love, there was a series coming out, coming out from the Getty Museum in California, which was, you had to make your own version of a masterpiece. So you would take a picture of a horse or something, make it out of your laundry on the floor and put it you, you, would, you would put yourself in the position of, of a Leonardo painting or something. You'd, really, you'd make a mock-up of the painting using domestic things, your, your bathrobe and your things like that. This was a whole series of very funny pieces that people were making. And I thought that was really quite a nice, creative way. And I think for, for artists, it was an opportunity because mostly, I mean, not always, but mostly artists are solitary. We tend to need time to reflect and work and think and read. So for us, being on our own, being isolated is not really a problem. It's what we're normally about. But and that is a strength that we can actually give to other people because other people who are locked in a, in a small apartment with two children and a, you know they're they're not used to being at home the whole day, and there sadly there were incidences in France of domestic violence as a result. People were you know forced to be with their partner and they realised that this isn't actually such a good idea sometimes. Um, so I think the, the the fact that artists are used to working creatively, being productive. Um, when they're on their own, is something that we can teach and we can help other people with, I think, you know, through through workshops and projects. It's something, maybe it, it's a way of, of communicating. I think people were maybe more able to understand what it is to be at it when they were in confinement themselves. In ways. We, we put ourselves in this particular kind of position so that we can meditate and, and develop our work. And it, for us, it's a choice. But for other people, it's actually quite painful to be on their own and to be ob obligated to be isolated. So I, I, I was thinking that this was maybe something that artists could actually help people with, you know, the ability to use your, use your solitude, use your silence you know, in a productive way. Yeah, I think actually the culture and arts in general kept the society sane in a way like now when you are explaining this and when we are talking and I'm thinking back, what was actually happening was arts. I mean, it was virtual, most of it, but what else was happening? I think not much other things. I mean, people were taking care of their foods and uh, toilet paper supplies, of course. I, it was completely gone in Germany. I couldn't get toilet paper for two weeks. 
But uh, what kept me sane, and I think most of my friends and people I know, was various art content online. So I think art in this case is very, very, very important. You know, I was fascinated with the priorities that uh, were suddenly up to everyone's uh, view. Uh, as you said, the toilet paper and, you know, the the East and so on, the, some, some of the supplies. And I think, as you said, that a lot of people at the end of the day uh, confided their confided themselves in, in the arts and in the uh, concerts that were online and... Arts and toilet paper, right? <laughs> arts and toilet paper, it's all about that. Uh, well, you need my, to... my point with the, the toilet paper and the arts is that at the end of the day we have... We, we kind of tend to forget how much impact arts actually has on our lives because we all listen to music we all watch movies, we all go to concerts, love theater and, and so on, but we just take all that experience for granted because it was so accessible before and during the quarantine, everyone wanted to go to a movie. Everyone wanted to go to a theater and wanted to go out, have a drink and listen to live concert. It was all this when suddenly arts, yeah, when we were cut off the arts, it was even stronger urge to to use it live. I think yeah. live experience. Like two weeks ago, I went to the cinema for the first time, and it was amazing to just be in the cinema, in the theater, to watch a film on the big screen and just feel this music and the whole experience. I missed that a lot. For example, it, it cannot be virtual. I tried also with the glasses to be in the cinema kind of environment during the pandemic, you know, with the virtual glasses, you sit in a cinema, but virtually it's, it cannot be the same. You don't have the smell, the sensor, uh, this whole experience being somewhere. I think, oh, it was really amazing. The best experience. Yeah. And it's also fun because when I the, the other day I was uh, in the city center, and I remember during the the end of the pandemic, uh, before uh, the quarantine was uh, uh, end, uh, initially ended, the streets were so empty. There were no musicians. There were no uh, performing artists on on the streets that are usually in the city center. And it was such a relief to go there and finally hear the live music again and the people talking and, you know, just, just this live, liveliness in, in the streets. It was uh, missing and it, it was quite um, terrifying to envision the future like this. But at the end of the day, I think that whole this whole experience is a great opportunity for us to change our old old habits, the bad habits and not, and not to go back to the way things were, but to find the, the future, um, future possibilities of how we can communicate with arts, how can the arts be projected, how can we experience it in different ways but that it still has the same impact as it did before. So to um, kind of draw... Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Oh, I think one of the ways that... Sorry, to, um, I, was, I was just thinking out loud, but um, I was just going to say that one of the ways that we uh, understand how valuable the arts are is to imagine their absence. So, I mean, for, for me, the fundamental thing about arts is that as, as, as children, providing we're healthy and have all our faculties, we have our senses, we have our taste and our touch and our, and our, our ear and our, and our eye. 
And the arts are really just developments of those five senses. We grow, the artists are the lucky ones who keep in touch with those five senses. The dancers keep on dancing and artists keep on scribbling and, and performers keep on moving. And, but most people, their lives take away from the arts, the way they're, they're obliged or they, they forget about the arts or they haven't been taught the arts very well, or they move into jobs, financial jobs, whatever, which seem to have nothing to do with the arts. So I think the arts are always struggling to, to get attention, say, look at us, we're, we're important, actually, we're important. Do you remember what it was like when you were a child? You know, we're, we're, you're still that person. And I think the confinement, in a way, gave people a chance to get back in touch with that very early, those very early memories of playing with uh, foodstuffs and uh, scribbling on paper and uh, doing crazy things in, in, your, in your flat. So maybe, maybe it's, it's been positive in that sense that it's um, because of the absence of everything else, people were kind of obligated to I think about arts. I think about getting involved in arts in, in a different way. Maybe that's just my, my feeling. So I was going to um, come in and ask some questions. I've been scribbling down as you've all been talking. And um, the things that you've all been saying all lead me to one question, which is how? So how do we make the museums and the galleries and the other institutions that you would like to remain open? How do you make that feasible? How do you make that a viable prospect for those people funding the galleries and museums who may not see the value in only 20 people being able to access the collection that day, whereas they're used to getting 20 people every 10 minutes, for example? Um, how do we share our skills with people when we're not allowed to gather in large groups, when we're not allowed to be face to face with people? I know that for me as a participatory artist, this is something that I'm kind of coming to terms with or trying to, you know, begin coming to terms with. Um, and how do we ensure equality of access for those that can't get back out? You were talking about your joy about being back out with music and with film. But what about those people that, you know, for the next 18 months can't come back out and re-engage in society because they need to stay protected for themselves or their family members. I think maybe, I mean, there's, I, I feel there is not just one way of solving this or one recipe for all the institutions and stuff like that, but maybe just for, galleries and museums it's maybe just i'm thinking out loud to have the system of being you know when you go to the doctor you need to make appointment and there should be like a maybe a universal platform i don't know inside one country where you make this appointment in advance but if this becomes um a regular thing people would probably get used to that and you know it will be limited it's not gonna be crowded but in a way maybe it's more pleasant as Lucia said prior to this question you know then you have also more time to spend with the art perhaps this is I don't know I'm thinking out loud because many people say the virtual experience is the next thing but I cannot agree with that. I mean, I work a lot with virtual arts, but at least for me, it's a completely different story. If it's a virtual experience or physical, this is totally different. Like it's a separate thing for me, but I'm just worried about the live concerts, for example, because for me, the most important factor in the concert is being in a crowd, feeling this amazing energy. But if it's, 10 people with a lot of distance in between, it's a bit strange, but perhaps maybe we will get used to it and it's gonna be like more one-on-one -on -one kind of performance. I don't know, I'm thinking out loud, but we will have to find the solutions for this kind of events where you need a massive crowd. And mm. maybe the thing is the, like a mask kind of, protection on the mouths I have no idea because I, I think corona is not the only thing which 
is facing us in the future. I'm sure it's going to be many bacteria, many viruses. Maybe it's a, a challenge for the fashion designers how to completely change the idea of clothes. And maybe we shouldn't think of protecting our um, boobs against being seen, but maybe the faces are the things which we need to hide. <laughs> I don't know. It's a challenge of how to completely change our fashion in the future. You know, when it comes to the masks, I think that the the first thing that people struggle with is the the covering of the face. I just... Yeah, the facial expressions, right? We... Yeah. we another level which there's we need. so much to to us when we interact with each other within a face that the masks masks are very inconvenient when it comes to that especially for uh, people who have uh, hearing loss or other mm. uh, disabilities and are very uh, dependent on the face and facial expression they've been sort of cut off within this. I mean, there, there are some uh, examples of different masks and so on. And even I have been working with the Chemical in Institute of uh, Ljubljana. We are trying to create some, some version of face mask that um, deactivates the, the virus and, and so on, that it's going to be very um, future driven. Uh, not just for COVID, but uh, other viruses as well. But it's very hard to, to get the grants to do the research. And, um, you know, you, you have uh, these sort of challenges. But uh, I have uh, also some thoughts on uh, the, the museums and galleries uh, working as the doctor's office <laughs> with an appointment. I think that psychologically, if, I mean, I, I, I don't want to assume that there are many more people like me who, who like to be alone in the museum or alone in the, the bookstore or library, but I bet that I would go more often to the gallery if I would know that I would have my space and time and I think that even that it can be a positive thing that if a lot of a lot more people thought thought of it this way, uh, they might actually uh, be more interested. They might actually get more food traffic that way from the people who don't usually go to the museums and galleries because of the crowds and um, so on. I, I don't know. I think there, there's some good psychology there. Yeah. I, I think one, one thing we're not thinking about now is the finances, because the Boutique Gallery in London, for example, has a fantastically ambitious programme of exhibitions. It, it ships in works from, from all over the world, etc. They have, they have millions and millions and millions of visitors every year. And although some of the exhibitions are free, the, the average price of an exhibition to go to a gallery is something like Twenty pounds or fifteen pounds or something. So the amount of money that they're getting every day is millions and millions and millions. If they're only having one or two people coming by appointment, physically they're not going to be able to survive. And, and in any government, all the all the all the countries, all the governments have been hit financially. France has had to basically invent some new currency, borrow some money. It's having to pay people to to not work. The, the financial impact of this is is only just beginning. So we're, we're, of course, very worried about the impact on the arts. Uh, but for the governments, the arts are nearly always the very bottom priority. So given that there are, the economy is, is in complete ruins in most countries, in, in Britain, for example, it was in ruins anyway because of Brexit, stupid, stupidly cutting ourselves off from our biggest trading partner. So even, even with Brexit, Britain was going to be in some trouble. With the, man, the mishandling of the, of the virus as well, the economic impact is just going to be disastrous. Uh, and the, the sheer levels of money needed to keep the Royal Opera going, to keep um, Covent Garden going, to keep the orchestras going. Um, and, and again, in, in, I think it's in the Metropolitan New York, if, if you close down the Metropolitan Theatre in New York for a certain time, 
the, the humidity starts to affect the, the floorboards, the lighting, the fabric of the building. And if you turn off the air conditioners in museums for a certain time, then the, the damp starts to affect the paintings. You know. So without huge amounts of regular money coming into museums and galleries, th there's no way that they can survive. The, the governments are just not going to have the money to be able to put in huge millions of pounds, which they need for jobs and healthcare and other things because of the virus. So I think the, the virus is one thing and the damage that it's done, but I think the, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will find a, a cure. Um, but once it's over, when it's over, there's going to be a huge financial problem for, for the arts. And, and we haven't even started really to think about how that's going to work, I think. I'm not going to have a popular opinion at the moment, but for example, um, when we're talking about the galleries and the appointments and so on, that would work, of course, for example, in Slovenia, because it's very small, it's very manageable, two million people and that's it. Basically, we're one big village uh, compared to <laughs> other countries. But for example, every year, I donate 0.5% of my income, income tax to cultural initiatives. And for example, if the government in Slovenia would take that 1.5% of income tax and you know, um, pour it into arts and create like a uh, a funding like uh, first aid kit funding uh, that would be one way of how we can try to to support and financially um, the museums and galleries and theaters and opera and so on I, I, know, I know in Germany they have, I think, a 5% a five percent for tax for art, I think it is. And it depends, not, not everybody, I think on some scales of taxes, it's it's 5% for the arts. But um, I, I think even that is not enough. That's the problem. I think the, the individual artists, in a way, can survive relatively easily. They don't need so much money. They just need to buy food and have a, have a space to work. But the more, the more group efforts, like orchestras and uh, film crews and film sets, then you're talking serious, seriously millions of, of money that's needed. So without private sponsors, I think that's, that's going to be difficult. Maybe we should just accept the fact that we will get some kind of virus soon and just relax and just live in the moment. YOLO! <laughs> Let's go to the theater. I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm joking now, but you know, we all start to invest more into our health, focus on the sports, nutrition, like really be strong in this field and get our immune system really strong, get out of the art studios on the sun, get vitamin D, paint outdoors again, you know, impressionism, reborn once again, dance, outdoors not practice indoors and uh, you know no I'm, I'm joking a little bit but i think uh, yeah this all these new solutions should go towards great health physical mental also i'm afraid uh, it's gonna impact the mental health a lot mm. it will show in the next years definitely this gap uh, on the artists and on the society in general. I also just recently listened to the podcast about some doctors which said that because now the new babies which are born, they are constantly surrounded with people with masks and they said that up to eight months, first eight months when the baby is born, the babies are just looking at the facial expression, but they are now don't they are not getting enough facial expressions and they cannot understand the words yet. Um, they will be 
permanently damaged because of that, you know, the new babies, new humans, and they don't know how this will influence the society in the future because the first eight months are critical to some subconscious development and I'm afraid the new generations will be completely different because of that. So, uh, yeah, it's really important to talk about the mental states as well in the next years, months, and um, I, I truly believe that the arts and the culture could help as much as the medical uh, researchers and uh, health teams. So if I go back to the opening line, which Lucia said, you felt very useless, you said, when the corona moment happened, but I think this was artificially produced somehow by the politics and the media, but I think artists are very essential to the society in the long term because um, I, I strongly believe that being an artist is not just to create things for themselves, but for the society in general and to, you know, help the evolution of human being one step forward every day. Yeah, you know, it was funny, uh, especially when when you said uh, for for the kids and for the society and the mental health and and so on. My nephew, he's five years old. Uh, he was suddenly taken out of the kindergarten. He didn't see any of his friends, and you know, he he started. He kind of kind of understood the situation but not fully and he started drawing the images the, the pictures of uh, corona uh, as he saw it in the media and he started drawing it and then crossing it and putting it outside on the toys you know on the uh, swings and so on and the trampoline because he was convinced that he says, uh, stop here, it's not going to come to his house, it's not going to affect him. He just wanted to, you know, tell Corona, you're not welcome here. And he became a painter as well, an artist, you see? He was motivated. Of course. <laughs> Amazing. The Corona is such a good motivation for new art. Yeah. <laughs> people. But uh, it is, I think it's going to be hard for kids because they're uh, they're not sure if they're going to open schools, if they're going to uh, start uh, classes, uh, or they're going to be online or they're going to be physically present. How is that going to affect students and teachers and especially the, the learning efficiency? Uh, there have been some drawbacks uh, that were um, noted. Uh, because it's harder for kids to to study and it's harder for them to maintain this, the social um, interaction and capabilities. And I know I, I think it's it's going to be seen in the years ahead uh, of what the the current effect. Uh, is on the, the long run. I think one thing we haven't one thing we haven't mentioned is environment. Well, we, we touched on it with the lack of aeroplanes, but that, that, that's maybe another positive thing because, for example, I in confinement I I didn't go shopping for two months. Literally, I didn't buy anything for two months. And that's because I had enough food in my house and my freezers. I have like two fridges and three freezers and a garden for vegetables. And literally I had no reason to buy anything for two months, which meant there's, there's no transport, there's no, there's no buses. Most of the trips that people make in their cars are unnecessary, really. You can shop once a month and live. You don't need to drive every single day. You know, there, are, there, are, there are ways around it. The, we know that cars and pollution is a problem. And because of the virus, we just stopped using cars. 
and you know we survived. So I think it's given us a chance to think about how we how we use transport. You know, I was to fly thousands of kilometers this year, and I haven't flown one. Um, um, and maybe maybe flying will never recover. I think that's a, a possibility thing. Just like museums may never recover, maybe flying, because keeping an airplane um, parked, um, you can only do it for so long before the airplane degrades. I think I'm right in saying that Singapore Airlines, for example, has has put all its aeroplanes in Australia because it's easier to keep them dry and safe in Australia. So there, there is no plane in Singapore airports. They're all sitting waiting in, in Australia. Um, and uh, Air France has already, licensed, has already got rid of some pilots. British Airways are getting rid of pilots, getting rid of their jumbo jets. I, I'm really not sure that this idea that we can just jump on a plane and go go somewhere for a weekend, that, that may be finished, that may be over. I think flying may, may never get back to what it was before. It may become again an elite thing, uh, a thing for business executives or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I think in terms of personal transport, it, the, the virus situation really does give us a chance to, to really think hard. We, we've had Greta Thunberg telling us, you know, the mistakes we're making for her and her future generation. And, and the, the biggest mistake is, is jumping in your car, really, and setting off somewhere where you don't really need to do it. So I, I think for me, the fact that I could live here for two months without one single car journey, uh, and it's absolutely no trouble at all. Really. I think maybe that's something that we can, we can build on, perhaps. Yeah, I find it that uh, when we were in quarantine for a month and a half, I think that everyone, even as hard as it was, everyone got a chance to really get themselves together, to get a good sleep, to eat well, to take care of themselves more than than before. And I was just discussing it with a friend of mine uh, a few weeks back that it would be very welcoming to the nature and to, to the people that we would have some sort of quarantine, mandatory quarantine every year, that no one could leave their house or go on vacation or take a plane, take a bus, take a, a car. For a month and a half, we would just have to deal with each other, deal with uh, the kids, partners and whatever, try to reconnect and let the nature take a breath and just be without us and not, not to affect it uh, all the, every day, all the time, as we do. that um, one of the one of the problems with that is a is kind of the assumption that everyone was okay or better than okay in quarantine um, and my I'm speaking not as a host member now I'm speaking as like a as a practitioner my experience has been that um, actually a lot of people have really really struggled in terms of mental health in terms of physical mental verbal abuse domestic abuse um and in terms of escalating mental health disorders that were either present before and have escalated or have um appeared during during this time um and yeah i think that if if I suggested to some of the people that I'm currently working with that we were going to do it every year, they'd probably say that they would rather not be here. Like it's, you know, for some people it's been that bad. And um, I also wanted to include the thread that's been woven through the conversation a little bit about being useless or powerless because I was feeling that really heavily. I was actually um, in the UK for work and almost got trapped and 
booked about eight flights to get one that would actually get me home and then just felt like well what am I going to do you know if I can't if I can't work which is kind of something that I really believe in that I believe does kind of good for the world then what am I going to do um and then actually um I found that grassroots arts organizations and arts charities particularly in the UK seem to be really quite resilient and really quite resourceful at, um, at managing their budgets and their projects in ways that enable the practitioners like myself to still work with people um, and so I went from feeling totally useless to feeling like you know I might be a little bit of a lifeline for these people in some in some way um, so perhaps that could be a way going forwards of artists interacting with with people the the projects that I'm working on are all kind of pilots or tests but you know some of it's some of it's using platforms online platforms like zoom some of it is using partner organisations that already have to be in contact, like social services and Yorkshire Carers um, and the Dementia and Alzheimer's Society. To they're already taking visits, you know, um, and key workers into people's homes to engage with them for for medical or kind of other really important reasons, and so physically passing things on to the partners to then take in with kind of guidance or you know little video clips or whatever perhaps this is a way that um in this kind of participatory work you could you could go forward um i have literally no answers when it comes to galleries and museums it absolutely terrifies me it absolutely terrifies me to think of a world where people might grow up and not be able to go to a space and see artwork and the artwork that's been preserved for hundreds of years, there may not be money to preserve it any longer. What's going to happen to it? Like, is it just going to sit there and just like flake? I don't know. I get really panicky <laughs> thinking well, about also it. To, like funding for future art. Mm. You know, well, where's it? Where's it going to leave us? I think that when it comes to. Um, mental I, I will get to the mental health again uh, i do a lot of work uh, and research focused on sustainability and we're usually focused on sustainability in uh, within environment or uh, fair fair pay fair trade and, and so on the economic sustainability and so on and i have this vision of a future that we will soon start to talk about mental sustainability. We will add this part to the triangle that we are currently talking because we are all talking about the products and how it affects people, the environment and the, econom uh, the economy. But we are not talking about our physical and mental health and that has to be Unfortunately, we are at the point of where we have to talk about actual sustainability of that. Because at any time, we can just snap and no one was prepared for this COVID and we are all stuck and forced into unknown situations that no one has ever faced before. And I think that it was hard and it still is hard on many many people because the the, the emotional effects and uh, economic effects are so great uh, that are uh, currently going on and i know from the the housing uh, situations to uh, as sarah jane said uh, the violence and uh, the divorce rates skyrocketed and we are just not equipped to deal with each other or with ourselves in a way that we can do it at any time. Having, having said that, just one thing. Um, 
the coronavirus is, of course, very, very bad, very serious, but so far it, hasn't, it isn't as bad as the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu killed 50 million people, and it followed the First World War, which killed another, God knows how many millions. So I think, you know, we, from my reading about the Spanish flu, it, it took two full years for people to get over the Spanish flu. The, the Spanish flu was, was so bad that if you saw somebody in the morning, they could be dead in the afternoon. It was just like whole, whole families were wiped out in days. You know. the, the population was weakened anyway because of the war. And there was also a, a subterfuge going on that people didn't want to admit it was happening because they, you know, for political reasons, et cetera, so they let it go. So I think we have to be, be, be relative. You know, we are in a very bad situation globally, um, but it's really nowhere near as bad as it was in 19, you know, 17, 18, whatever. So that, and we recovered from that somehow or other. You know. and, um, the, there, I agree there probably are going to be more pandemics, but historically they seem to come, you know, every hundred years. So something like that. So, you know, hopefully we'll have learned something from this one. We should have learned something from the Spanish flu. Um, and in fact, in fact, some of the viruses that are, some of the vaccines that are there now were already started two or three years ago because of previous influenza viruses, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think, you know, I, I remain cautiously optimistic on that front. I think it's a terrible situation. It's going to have enormous impacts, enormous financial impacts, mental health impacts, et cetera. But I think we have to relativize it. That it it's, you know, our, our ancestors, our grandfathers and grandmothers went through something way much worse than what we've been going through. And I think that's uh, just, just as a way of relativizing our own position. I think, I think we are in a stronger position now to be able to resist and to, to come out more positive uh, as a result. Plus we have the technology, so yeah. Yeah. it's way easier now to stay in touch with people, to communicate and... And, and for scientists to work together and collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should embrace that even more and but uh, not to rely just on that, but go hand in hand together. I think it's amazing how we can use that and pro like, uh, as you said, keep in touch and definitely use it as a strong media and tool in the future. And I'm curious what new ways we will discover because uh, I think it's many, many more options we haven't tried yet and they will definitely show themselves through different art projects actually i think the artists are experimenting a lot with technology and then some things become then also live practice i like the initiatives where they combine arts and science together and try to create something out of uh, out of the frames it's something extraordinary and um, i think it's Plus, uh, before you said with the, the Spanish flu and the whole situation, it was harder because there was this, it was a lot going on. But I think in a way that it's easier for, for us now is the technology that we have. We have internet, we have instant information, we can uh, easily, you know, uh, inform people and but on the downside, we, we do have a lot of uh, disinformation and a lot of uh, um, fear that is being created through um, these abuses of uh, the technology. But I mean, for, for every uh, positive thing, there is always a downside to, to it. So, yeah. I think that um, we seem to be coming towards a, a sort of natural, a natural close. I'm pleased that it's on a relatively positive note because it's just like um, the whole quarantine period. It's kind of been a bit of a like a roller coaster discussion with like lots of like optimistic points, but also some you know pessimistic points as well. And, and none of us can be sure what's going to happen. But um, I actually feel very reassured about, um, yeah, relati relativizing it, Ken, because I think that that makes it, it makes me think that, you know, if those artworks are here after that, 
then maybe they will be here after this, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, would anybody like to add any um, closing thoughts or comments or questions for the people that will be watching on YouTube? Um, I would just encourage people to really now um, go to as many live events as you are allowed, because probably there is still some restrictions. Really wash your hands. Like, even when the pandemic is over, please just continue washing your hands. This is like, for me, it's so strange that we have to, we had to learn to wash the hands again. Like, I mean, like, seriously. So wash the hands and then definitely enjoy being live somewhere and then just really be present in the moment. Reading uh, about the transportation, you know, many of the meetings can be Zoom meetings as well, so we don't have to travel constantly. This is also important. So when you actually travel, it, it's really meaningful to be physically present somewhere. This is just my thoughts. And really focus on body-mind connection. Physical health is as much as important as mental health. So if you're physically very fit, then think about your mental health and uh, vice versa. And um, I think this is just like general thoughts about the arts. There's gonna be many, many struggles in the next months and years but I'm sure and positive that we're going to find some great solutions. And I'm not worried that the arts will someday just stop because there are so many creative people among us and it's a strong energy of being creative. And I know, uh, like, you know, humans are very creative beings. So I'm sure it will never stop my thoughts on the arts. And I hope the next year uh, we can come to the Canary Islands, actually, so the live events can happen. And in this case, make meaningful travel, be there and maybe create some new arts physically in the space. I, I truly hope so. And hello from Ljubljana. Uh, I think that the fear of arts disappearing or not being present is is pointless because it's in human nature to create art to express yourself with we've, we've seen it from the cave paintings to everyday children trying to um, prevent corona from entering their playgrounds so I think that when when it comes to art as an expression, we will be okay. There are some. Uh, I would like to encourage people to try and find the solutions to the future of concerts, galleries, and museums that we didn't manage to to get the uh, proper uh, proper idea of how to do that. And of course, as uh, Valerie said, wash your hands, try to support arts as much as possible, and don't forget about the physical distancing, and please wear masks, even though they are very uncomfortable and inconvenient. But uh, at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves that we're not doing it just for ourselves, but for everyone. Yeah, and you don't need so much toilet paper as you think, I would add. Exactly. That. Do not binge it's shop. For, yeah, it's for the nature as well. Don't throw it, use it so much in general. Like, the world won't end if you don't have a toilet paper. Exactly. On, on that note, I saw a very good cartoon here with the, the dinosaurs were watching, looking up to the sky and they see a comet coming towards the earth and they realize that they're their, their fate is, is, is numbered, their days are numbered. And one dinosaur says to those, we must rush off and get some toilet paper. <laughs> so, <laughs> but on a, on, a, on a serious note, I would agree with points made. Um, and also, you know, 
we, we, we don't take influenza seriously enough. Influenza kills thousands of people every winter. And we, we never talk about it, it just happens. 17,000 in France last year, something like that. It's, it's thousands and thousands of people. And it's because we don't wash our hands and we don't wear masks and we don't, we don't use those rules. So not just for corona, but for all other diseases, we would actually improve our health service, improve our own health and safety, our own lives by carrying on with these precautions. They're obviously, you know, they're, they're science-based and they're completely logical. But on, on a general note, I would, I would still stay upbeat. I think we're going through a very difficult time. I'm, I'm confident that the scientists will, will co collaboratively find some way through this. So the, the big problems are financial, probably, in the future, and how we get around that. But I think the artists are, you know, what we're good at is being inventive and being creative and, and thinking through problems. That's what, if you had to define what art was, for me, it's creative problem solving. So give us a problem and, and we'll, we'll find some way to sort it. So for me, artists are absolutely crucial to the, to the mental health and the physical health of, of humankind at, at large. And we, we often undermine ourselves, but actually I see art as being absolutely essential at the heart of, of everything that we do. Absolutely. Okay, so let's, let's wrap up. Um, before we go, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panelists for all being here, contributing your time and your energy voluntarily to be part of the festival. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Valerie, Lucidia and Ken. We really appreciate you being here. Um, so thank you, guys. Thank you. And good luck with the festival. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's weird when people say thank you to us. We're like, um, like, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, it's it feels yeah. really weird because we get so much out of doing the festival that we don't feel like we necessarily um, need to be thanked, but thank you. <laughs> um, and we'll get the, the video up onto YouTube probably by Monday or Tuesday. Um, if you want to have any of your personal information on the, um, like, text, panel like a website link or something else that you would like to share alongside this video if you just send it to us via email um, and we'll make sure that goes into the, the information panel um, and we'll send the link to you directly when it's up so that you know that it's up as well okay superb thank you guys and next, next year, year I'm really happy to shake your hands <laughs> live yeah, fingers crossed we can all be meeting in person next year <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's been uh, my second time uh, at the, the festivals and I was so excited this year because I wanted to come uh, to Lanzarote uh, last year and this year I was so excited because it was also Fuerteventura and this happened. Next year, Lucia, we go together. <laughs> of course. Yes. I should say that I, I, I did a festival here in France too for the last 10 years and uh, last year we collaborated with uh, Lacuna Studios so, and this year I decided that I wouldn't do my festival, uh, just to have a break. So, <laughs> so, Hopefully next year we all meet live. Maybe, yeah, we have other chances. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. We'll create a panel reunion. Yeah. A panel reunion, yeah, that'd be awesome. Live mode, not... Uh... Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. Stay safe, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.